It's been a while since I did this series, isn't it? Sorry about that, got sidetracked with other stuff. Rest assured I will be finishing this series very soon. That is the actually, to date, the only Legacy of Kane game on a Nintendo system. I played this off the GameCube version, which I wish I didn't have to, but it's the only copy of the game I own. Why reluctantly? Well, the GameCube version doesn't have progressive scan built in, so I was unable to record it off my Wii. I wish I had the PlayStation 2 version, but I suppose I had to make do of what I had. Development for Blood Omen 2 started around the same time as Soul Reaver 2, as forementioned in my Soul Reaver 2 video. The plan was to get Blood Omen 2 out first, but after Soul Reaver was a massive success, Soul Reaver 2 was given accelerated development. The plan was to have the two sagas going on concurrently. Soul Reaver would focus on Raziel, while Blood Omen would focus on Kane. They saw that the Kane character had unmarked potential. They also decided to move Blood Omen to the 3D action genre, which was becoming the major genre in video games. The story this time would set in a previously unexplored era of Legacy of Kane, taking place before Kane would resurrect Raziel and his brethren as his enforcers. Of course, to get around how Kane wouldn't have all his powers that he did at the end of Blood Omen, Kane would be defeated pre-game and awaken many years later, thus he's forgotten all his abilities. How convenient. Blood Omen 2 is widely regarded as the weak link in the Legacy of Kane series. The crew of the Soul Reaver games and the crew of Blood Omen 2 did not really collaborate. According to Daniel Kaboko, the higher-ups of Crystal Dynamics and Eidos didn't really get Soul Reaver. They wanted more sexual elements of a Simbor story, and that had an effect on Blood Omen 2 as seen with Uma's much more revealing design compared to how people usually dress. Amy Henning and the Soul Reaver team seemed to anticipate these changes that they would make to their Legacy of Kain series, hence the ending of Soul Reaver 2 accommodating for the changes. According to the Legacy of Kain wiki, the look of Blood Omen 2 was influenced by the styles of Blood Omen and Soul Reaver, wanting to show more of the Soul Reaver era's technologies in full operation, and taking Blood Omen's medieval feel forward a few centuries. The team settled on Victorian feel with traces of Gothic and steampunk, and built an industrial revolution around the glyph magic technologies. Inspired by dark cities and literature, films, and real-world European capitals, Steve Frost explicitly acknowledges Dracula's Castle, the Batman films, the City of Lost Children, Victorian London, and Paris. The Blood Omen 2 team decided to set the game within a large, expansive single city with a dark and brooding atmosphere. All that does give Blood Omen 2 its own feel, but unfortunately it creates a bit of a departure from previous games. There were certain mishaps during this story that the last game defines what to go out of the way to explain, but we'll cover that later, we got some story details to go into. So sometime after Blood Omen 1, the Seraphim Lord attacked Nosgoth and Kane was felled and knocked into a hundred year coma. The Seraphim Lord also took the Soul Reaver as a trophy. Kane is awakened by Uma. Thus sets up the basic revenge plot. Kane must regain his strength, build up his allies, and get his revenge on the Seraphim Lord. Typical legacy of Kane plot. Along the way, Kane meets former allies who have betrayed him to the Seraphim Lord. That pretty much sums up Blood Omen 2. On first glance, it's not really connected to the other games. In fact, there was such a disconnect that the next game, Defiance, had to go out of its way to explain some of the inconsistencies. But, due to time constraints, they weren't able to explain all of them, which I'll get into in a minute. So like always, we'll start with Kane. Back in the role of main character at last, brought to life once again by Simon Templeman, who manages to make the best out of what he has to work with. I seem to remember that I played the pawn once before. It ended badly. Kane's still arrogant. I care not for any dangers. They will fear me, do you hear? Tell me where to find the Seraphim Lord. I'll have him buried within the hour. Of course, we have the classic because this character was asleep for hundreds of years. He's lost much of what he learned. I'm reminded of Samus Aran in Metroid Prime 1. His main source of development is with Uma who he takes an interest in. Kane's never had a love interest until now, even though most of Uma's guidance is telling him where to go. Go here, go there. What do you take me for? Your errand, boy. I'm glad somebody in video games managed to say what we've all been thinking. There's this one part where he expresses some really good wit. You tried to murder me. I seem to have failed. The way he gains the power of the bosses is a little weird. He does some recital that fuses their soul with his, I'm guessing, even though that's more Raziel's thing than Kane's. Yeah, they screwed up here. 
On one occasion, Kane does show a more noble side, but he also shows a dark side that I'm not sure I'm comfortable with. We'll get into it. Vorador is the leader of the Resistance. Why is he back to life? Vorador absolutely should have stayed dead after the original Blood Omen. He served his purpose in the narrative. Now, the reason for this was apparently miscommunication between the Soul Reaver and Blood Omen teams. Somebody mentioned that Vorador was dead, but that critique was clearly ignored. Not only that, but Vorador doesn't really get to do much in this role. I would have preferred they just made an entirely new character, but I guess they wanted somebody established. No mention as to how he's not dead anymore. They do reference his Blood Omen death. Do you so wish to return to the grave, old friend? But that's it. That's all we get. I'm guessing something happened and he's dead again by Soul Reaver, but who knows how that happened. Our bosses this time are, well, let's just start with Faustus. There's not really much to him. He's just simply a former lieutenant of Kane's who switched sides. What is our kind? In serving the Seraphim, I have protection. I have power. And who better to hunt down a vampire than a more powerful vampire? History is written by the winners, Kane. That is my kind. He is basically a warm-up boss that requires you to master blocking and using mist to hide and set him on fire. Marcus is a dirty coward. One of Kane's former lieutenants. Noticing a pattern here? We get a little bit of backstory with him. In your arrogance, you presumed me dead. But I was stronger than you knew. I crawled from my haven and fled into hiding. <laughs> That's the Marcus I remember. His boss fight mainly consists of him running around, chasing him, and catch him. So this fight goes on much longer than I would have liked. Sebastian is more direct in betraying Kane. You arranged the ambush that destroyed my army. You sold yourself to our enemy. I dealt the blow that cost you the war. Glorious, was it not? So many killed so quickly. And all my doing. Yeah, I'm running out of things to say about these guys. He does have a little more personality in his boss fight by attempting to destroy the Nexus Stone, which is the plot MacGuffin that will allow Kane to take on the Seraphim Lord directly. But overall, there's not much depth to him. Magnus is one of Kane's former lieutenants, but this one actually has some depth to him. More of a tragic villain than anything else. He's been driven mad by centuries of torment. By the time he meets Kane, there's not much left of him but a raving madman. But once he is defeated, he professes his loyalty to Kane, and Kane shows some altruism. I was your champion. You never returned. I failed you. I tried to kill him. Even now, I cannot remember how he defeated me. I was struck down, helpless at his feet, and then, through his foul magic, he took my mind and transported me here to this hellhole. But what of you, sire? I heard that you were dead. Or not so dead as some would like to have me. As you see, I have returned. Magnus, my champion, you have suffered long enough. It is with pride that I grant you your death. <clears throat> Sire, my thanks. I guess that does balance out the other thing Kane does in this game. Janos is the beast that rots in the prison. This is apparently what Kane meant at the end of Soul Reaver 2, that Janos must stay dead. His role in this game is very small. He does serve as the voice of reason between Kane and Vordor, so he continues his role as Mr. Exposition. I have a clip for that, but we'll get to it. My sire... They killed you. No, far worse. Yeah, about that. I saved her for last, Uma, as she is the most controversial character in the whole game. Her whole design is basically for sex appeal, which is notable because the series had largely avoided falling into that hole. As Daniel Kabuko put it, For me, sexy isn't about how much breast or thigh you can show, but rather about the beauty of the design and how much it complements what you have versus trying to reveal it. She serves as the mission control for Kane, and an attraction starts to form between the two, but then she betrays Kane at the climax for some reason. She does say that his rule will be no different than the Seraphim Lords, and Kane doesn't really have an answer for her. And Kane does perhaps his cruelest act in the whole series. Kane, I'm dying. Yes, you are. I need your blood. Please, you can save me. I know. Tell me, child, do you see me ruling Nosgoth? Yes, yes, I see it now. And do you believe that Nosgoth rightly belongs to me? I do, I believe it, Kane. please. Then you may die, 
knowing the truth. <gasps> no! You should never have betrayed me. You could have been my queen. Okay. Oh. Now, you have left me alone. Yeah, one of his appeals is that Cain is morally ambiguous. This is the closest he gets to doing something that is truly evil. The story is weak. Compared to the previous three games, something about it feels off. The writing isn't as sharp, the dialogue is a bit dull-witted, the voice actors are trying their best to carry it, but they can only do so much. It's also filled with retcons and inconsistencies with the rest of the Legacy of Cain timeline. Like, there's this part where Cain descends further into prison, and what I thought were aliens were unleashed, or monstrous experiments. I'm gonna guess technology regressed in the thousand years between this and Soul Reaver. So how does the gameplay feel? Compared to Blood Omen, which was a top-down adventure game akin to The Legend of Zelda, Blood Omen 2 is a 3D action game. Kane can jump and float down to his objective, which I swear feels a little awkward to control. Maybe just because I'm playing this on GameCube. Kane does have access to some abilities. He maintains the Mist ability, which is used to get a stealth kill on your enemies. I suppose this is a good time to get into the combat. Basically, in this game, it revolves around blocking your opponent's attacks and hitting back. Eventually, Kane's rage meter will build up, and Kane can unleash a deadly combo that will surely kill your opponent. Kane can get access to weapons, but unlike the original Blood Omen where you had access to various swords, here they degrade over constant use or before breaking, and there's really no difference as to whether you have a knife or an axe, it's roughly the same thing. Also, every time Kane sucks blood, it takes up a little too much time. Next to the health vial, there's a lore vial, which serves the purpose of whenever it reaches full, your main health will be upgraded, so you want to get as much blood as you can. In addition to the mist ability, Kane will gain abilities when he defeats the boss. First up is the jump ability, which allows Kane to reach far distances, a very useful ability. Charm, which allows Kane to mind control NPCs, which is used to solve puzzles. Berserk, which is basically an upgraded fury. Telekinesis, which allows Kane to hit switches from afar. And finally, Immolate, which is basically a one-hit kill. After I unlock this ability, I can't count the number of times I would just block the strike until my rage mirror filled up, so I could just kill them in one shot. Why do some of the enemies in this game look like aliens? It just really gives the sense that they don't belong in the Legacy of Kane. When it comes to these glyphs, many puzzles basically revolve around turning the wheel or flipping the switch to make sure the green stuff gets to where it wants to go. Why are things powered like this? It's never been a thing before. Not to mention one thing I noticed in this game, the levels in Blood Omen 2 can be really long. Like, it took over two hours to beat some of these. Eventually, I was going through the corridors, heading towards the goal, and once again, I found myself asking the question, when does this end? Which, like I said before, is something I never want to utter when I'm playing a game. I suppose now that I'm at the end, I'll finally talk about the Seraphim Lord, which is odd because he's not the Seraphim. In fact, he has nothing to do with the Seraphim. I really wish the team had communicated with the Soul Reaver team more. The only reason Kane has to run from this guy is because he has the Soul Reaver. Without it, he's just a weakling. What a weak villain. It doesn't really add anything. It matters not. The gate remains open, and even as we speak, my army, the likes of which this soft world has never seen, prepares to enter. Moskov is still mine for the taking. Sure it is. I will admit I do like how King can use his abilities to cause trouble for whatever's inside. What a weird disconnect. Also, Kane, what is going on with that outfit you're wearing? The shoulder pads are inconsistent. Kane meets Vordor and Janos. Tensions rise because Kane killed Uma, but no time for that to go anywhere. Time for the final showdown. Did it not occur to you that perhaps my cause, and not yours, the cause of right, of justice? That your ambition to rule this world is but the youthful craving of a petty noble who has gained too much power? Kane attempts to blame the Seraphim Lord for Uma's death, but that wasn't the case apparently, but once again we have no time for that. The first half of the fight against the Seraphim Lord is weird. You have to telekinetically push him to the ledge and then jump at him to deal damage. The process is annoying and from there it's just fight him hand to hand, or just immolate him when your rage is full. Once that's done, Yanos comes in and gives Kane the time he needs to grab the Soul Reaper. Unfortunately, Yanos is thrown into the pit where he suffers a fate worse than death. For all time. No! Kane! And now. 
tragic, really. Armed with the Soul Reaver, the final battle is incredibly anticlimactic. One day we shall return. Should your kind reach that place of banishment again, I will be waiting. <laughs> you will not live that long. I have lived long enough to dispose of you. Well, that's the end of him. Can't say I'll miss him. Kane does try to reflect on what's happened. How will his rule be any different? Well, we'll just have to take his word for it. So Blood Omen 2 is not very good. It opened up tons of inconsistencies. The aesthetics were different. The story was considerably weaker, and it was pretty much the death kill for the series. One more game came out, and we will be done with Legacy of Kane. After that game, then I'll get into some other stuff. The war was over, and yet there was another battle to be fought. The cruel masters of Nosgoth, the Sarafan, now leaderless, still had to be put down. There were cities to be rebuilt and order to be restored, and a new rule, my rule, would then begin. To the victor go the spoils. At last, Nosgoth would be mine. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please hit that bell, like, and subscribe button. If you want updates, follow me on Twitter or join my Discord or follow me on Twitch or provide in the description below. See you next time.